Hello everyone, this is Mr. Zoller and I'm going to be presenting to you today about Andrew Jackson from Chapter 14 and this is going to be a two-part uh, web uh, screencast so uh, this is going to be part one and we'll go ahead and show you what uh, we're going to be going over today. Uh, so first we'll be looking at the essential question and then the main things I'm going to be covering today are going to be the background of Andrew Jackson, his inauguration when he becomes President of the United States, uh, what was his approach to governing, and then a, um, an event that we call the nullification crisis. So looking at our question, so how well did Andrew Jackson promote democracy? So in other words, how is he en enabling people to be able to participate in the government? Uh, so we're going to be looking at Jackson from four different groups, and they're going to have different points of view about him. So we have the rich and well-born, so that'd be the wealthy class in America, the commoners, common people. Uh, we'll have people that believe in states' rights, so going back to like the anti-federalist and then uh, Native Americans, and they're all going to have different opinions of Jackson. So first, let's look at Andrew Jackson. So he was born in South Carolina in 1767. Uh, he was a young boy during the American Revolutionary War, about 13 or 14 years old, if I remember correctly. Um, his mother and his brothers end up dying um, in a prisoner camp during the war. And um, as he gets older, he moves out west to Tennessee and uh, is kind of like a self-made man. He works himself, has worked his way up, and uh, becomes a successful attorney, a lawyer, gets married. And um, as you've already learned, in the War of 1812, he was a war hero at the Battle of New Orleans, uh, where he was able to defeat the British, even though the war was already over at that point. Uh, and then he's also going to be, um, in his own way, acquiring Florida for the United States, which we'll cover in a different video at a different time. So Jackson is going to run for president in 1824, and his main candidates you can see he's running against there. We have Henry Clay, William Crawford, and John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, the second president of the United States. And if you look on the map over here, you can see that none of the candidates received over half of the, uh, oh, that's the popular vote, I'm sorry. None of them received over half of the electoral vote. So then the vote would go to the House of Representatives, and as you can see, Andrew Jackson did receive more popular votes from the people than John Quincy Adams, uh, but he didn't win the presidency. And so what happened is in a, what we call the corrupt bargain in 1824. So Henry Clay, who had uh, didn't have enough uh, votes to become president, uh, he's the leader of the House of Representatives, Speaker of the House, and he is able to convince members of the House to cast their votes for John Quincy Adams over Andrew Jackson and then Henry Clay gets a cabinet position from John Quincy Adams after that so a lot of the supporters of Andrew Jackson believe that there was a sneaky behind the uh, works deal that would give uh, John Quincy Adams the presidency and so Jackson and his supporters vowed in the next election in 1828 that things would be different. And you can see Andrew Jackson has a lot of the support from many southern states um, up here in the middle uh, region and heading out west here. So 1828, we're going to have Andrew Jackson is going to kind of reform and have other people with him, reforming the Democratic Party, and their focus is on the common man, the common people. Not having the country run by the elite, by the wealthy anymore, but what about the common man, the farmers? And a lot of people that are moving out to the west in this area, that would be the type of people they would be. And so in 1828, Andrew Jackson does win that election uh, quite easily. So John Quincy Adams runs for re-election. He ends up losing, as you can see here, and Jackson receives 178 of the electoral votes, so easily over 50% uh, at that time. So for Jackson's inauguration, it was quite the spectacle in Washington, D.C. So uh, the wealthy upper class had been used to a cordial, formal ceremony when it came to the inauguration. Um, and so Andrew Jackson, they view as a country bumpkin who's from Tennessee, now the White House. And so Jackson's going to be the very first president, uh, not born into wealth, not born rich, and, uh, but working his way up, being a common man. So he's the first common man president, and that's the group of people that he's representing. Uh, so since you have all the poor and large group of people that supported him, he had over 10,000 people that came to Washington, D.C. to celebrate his victory and here's a picture down here, uh, as you can see, of the White House. And huge mobs were going in, trying to greet him. And the story goes that Jackson actually had to sneak out and 
uh, and get out of the White House because he was afraid he was going to be uh, smushed against a wall, uh, suffocate. And so there were horses and there were um, animals running loose everywhere. And so for the rich and well-born, they view this as a travesty. This is horrible that this is happening to a president in the White House. How dare these commoners do this sort of thing? And so you can see right here that, well, one of the reasons why Jackson wins the election in 1828 is voting rights have changed. So as uh, from 1800 here to 1830, uh, so the states here in red uh, just have qualifications based on how much you're paying in taxes to vote. Uh, the orange states represent universal suffrage for white males, which means that all white men have the right to vote as long as they're 21 in those states. And the ones that are still green uh, you had to own land, had to own property. So you can see from 1800 to 1830, uh, quite a bit change, and that's going to change the groups of people that can vote. It's no longer the wealthy landowners that are the only ones that can vote. Now it can be a uh, common taxpaying men. So when Jackson earned, uh, won the election, he decided that um, there's two things I'm going to be going over right here. So one is called the kitchen cabinet. So Jackson didn't really rely on his actual cabinet members so much. Uh, he trusted more with his uh, friends and his supporters uh, because those are the people he's trusted uh, his life and he respects their opinion so there were times when he would meet with them in the White House in the kitchen there and so they got the nickname of the kitchen cabinet where he would ask his friends for advice because that's the role of the cabinet is to give advice to the president and then for the spoil system this is something that Jackson's opponents uh, printed lots of articles about and were upset about and that's because Andrew Jackson was removing uh, government officials and putting in uh, Democrats, his own supporters in those jobs. And so they over-exaggerating, saying he was getting um, rid of everybody. But in real reality, he only removed about 10% of the government officials. And that was about the same as his predecessors had done before him. But some people weren't qualified. And he had found out that some people were um, embezzling and getting money out. Uh, and so he would fire them from their job. And so we call it the spoil system. Uh, because of the idea that to the victor or the winner belongs the spoils or prizes of war. So you know, if you're the winning the president, and then you get to choose who would have those types of jobs. And today, now, if you want to be in the government and have those types of jobs, you do have to take tests uh, to make sure that you're capable and have a uh, requirement to do that. An uh, interesting side story about Jackson, there was a, I want to say it was the Postmaster General, I could be wrong, um, who had fought in the Revolutionary War. And so he went to Jackson begging him that he could keep his job, showing him his injuries as a veteran that he had suffered. And uh, Jackson said, well, this man has given, done so much for our country. Yeah, he definitely can keep his job. So Jackson, a veteran, uh, had sympathies for other veterans that had fought as well. But we'll find out that's not for all people that had fought. Nope, went too far there. Uh, so in 1828, we're going to have a big crisis that's going to come up in the United States uh, while Jackson is president. And this is going to be a foreshadowing of what is going to lead to the American Civil War. It's the issue of nullification. So if you're going to nullify something, it means you're going to ignore it. Uh, so it would be like if your parents were telling you that uh, for school today, uh, all we're going to have you do is you're just going, you're not going to wear a shirt today. You're just going to go to school, no shirt at all, just your pants. Um, you'd be like, uh, I don't think so, Mom and Dad. I, I need to have all my clothes on. I'm not, I'm not going to go to school that way. And so if you reject what they're saying and say, no, I'm not going to do that, that is what nullify is. You're going to ignore it. And it's usually going to be something that is completely off the wall that you wouldn't, wouldn't want to do. Uh, so what had happened is the Congress raised taxes in 1828, and we have what are called tariffs. And so that means that anything that was coming into the United States would be taxed, and it's promote businesses in America so that American-made goods are cheaper for Americans to buy. And so the purpose of this tariff was to help out the northern, northeastern businesses uh, where a lot of the factories and manufacturing are at. Uh, so the southern states did not agree with these tariffs because it ended up hurting them because they have to buy these goods, and they're buying a lot of them from other countries, and they're trading their cotton for it. And they see this as hurting their way of life. And they didn't think it was fair that the United States would make a law that would help one region of the country while it hurt the other. So Andrew Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun, called on the southern states and South Carolina in particular to nullify or reject those tariffs. And so Andrew Jackson as president had to decide what to do about that because a state is refusing to pay these tariffs. 
Um, there were even some supporters in South Carolina, some states' rights supporters. They strongly believed in what the power of the state was, threatening that if the United States doesn't change these laws and get rid of these uh, tariffs, then South Carolina will just leave the United States and not be a part of it anymore. And we call that secession or to secede. And so Andrew Jackson said, it basically sent a message saying, the first person I can catch in South Carolina uh, who does that, I'm going to hang from a tree. And so he threatens to send in the troops into South Carolina to make sure that the people in South Carolina are paying their taxes and it works and the South people in South Carolina relent and um, so Jackson even though he is was born in South Carolina and he does believe in the rights of states he believed that union was important and that we cannot have one state just leaving the country and as I said this is going to lead uh, to future conflicts in the United States as well so this is just kind of a foreshadowing so in the end here, so how did well did Andrew Jackson promote democracy? So looking at these people, so for the rich and well-born, we have kind of their disgust of having a common person in the government, replacing these qualified people in the government with commoners. Uh, while the common people, we can view them as they view them as a hero. Somebody finally somebody like them is in the as president, somebody that cares about them. And then for the states' rights supporters, uh, the threatening of bringing in the troops. Uh, to end their uh, nullification, uh, they're not going to be strong supporters of Andrew Jackson. Uh, well, thank you for watching the screencast, and remember you can go back and review, and I'll see you in part two.